Uh, Acts chapter 2 is where we are, so let's go ahead and open up your Bibles if you haven't done that yet. <clears throat> and so last week we uh, transitioned into this day of Pentecost, right? As we get into chapter 2, we got through the first four verses. And so uh, let's go ahead and read uh, verses 1 through 13 and, and get that out on the, on the plate for us this morning, and we'll start to work our way through it with a little bit of review uh, as, we, as we listen and as the Spirit reminds us, and we look at our notes that we've written. And, uh, and, and so, Brian, if you wouldn't mind, would you read those first 13 for us? Thank you. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. Oh, Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for salvation, uh, Lord. And, and we know even as, I, as Brian reads those last couple of verses, uh, there are always going to be the two camps and the two people groups that we continue to talk about, that there will be people uh, that continue in amazement and perplexity, but that when they hear these things and ask, what does it mean, uh, that you would grant understanding, and there will be those who mock. And, uh, and so, Lord, we know that that's the case even for us, and we pray that we would continue to be strengthened by your Spirit, be filled with your Spirit as, as these uh, disciples were, and that we would be able to do as they did, just to go out and be used by you for whatever your will is, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, great job reading through those names and the, the couple of verses there. So uh, um, there'll be a test uh, for everybody to try to pronounce all those words, but uh, at the end of class maybe. Uh, but as we see, you know, these first four verses we looked at last week, remember we've been waiting, the, the uh, apostles and the disciples have been in that upper room. Remember about how many people were in that upper room waiting for this? About 120, good. And uh, they're waiting on the day of Pentecost because remember, what is it that they're waiting for? Good, the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus told them before he ascended, uh, you know, be ready. You're going to go out and preach the gospel, but wait until the Holy Spirit comes that I promised you. And we see the Holy Spirit came upon them. Remember, there was a rushing wind, and these tongues of flames of fire came and rested upon them and equipped them to do uh, amazing things here. And so we talked about the amazing gift uh, that the Spirit gave uh, these, you know, these particular disciples uh, which was to be able to speak in tongues. And so we spent some time last week talking about that word. It's uh, glossa is, is the word that's um, translated in English tongues. It means, uh, remember, a dialect of language that is somebody else's language. It said there, even in the text, that uh, remember they were, they were confounded because these Galileans are speaking to them each in their own language. So we went to some other texts just to uh, support that view and to say that, you know, when we see the speaking of tongues in the scriptures, in the New Testament in particular, uh, it is the speaking in a uh, in intelligible language. It's an actual dialect of language. And so uh, that's, that's what the amazing thing is here, is that they didn't have to learn these languages God immediately just gifted them with being able to comprehend and speak, you know, these languages to people. And so uh, what an amazing thing, right? What a, a miracle that is. Uh, and I think uh, Brian and I talk about that often when we use the word miracle, because people use the word miracle a lot and throw it around a lot. And, and, uh, and certainly miracles happen, and God is a miraculous worker. 
But a lot of times we just say, oh, this is a miracle, that's a miracle. And remembering that miracle is special and is different. That it's, uh, I like the way Brian, how do you usually put it? It's something that happens kind of out of the the ordinary. Yeah, a miracle is something that uh, abrogates or does away with the normal laws and rules of the universe. Like natural. Yeah. Good. So it's it's not natural, right? right? It's supernatural. Yeah. So a lot of times people mistakenly say, "Oh, it's a miracle," because something worked out the way they wanted it to, right. and it lined up. But there was no um, violation of a natural law. I mean, gravity was still working. But right. A miracle is if you know I jumped up and dunked the basketball. Right. Uh, that would be overcoming gravity, which right. I normally cannot do. Right. Which is why this exactly is a great miracle. Because they didn't have, God didn't tell them, hey, Jesus didn't say, while you're in the upper room, you know, take these Rosetta Stone courses and, and learn these learn these languages, and you learn this one, you learn this one, you learn this one. I'm going to send you to the Cretans and you to the, uh, you know, Cappadocians and you to uh, to Asians and, and all those things. He just miraculously, you know, just transplanted it in them. He just, boom, immediately downloaded it to their hard drive so that they know what those people are speaking and, more importantly, that they are able to speak because what is it that they are now speaking to these people? What is the whole purpose of this miracle? Sharing. Speaking the gospel. Yeah, and and I think we're going to see, you know, throughout uh, the book of Acts as we do throughout the scriptures that what is the purpose of miracles, uh, and this wasn't in the notes, this is just a good little sidebar, uh, that miracles, you know, what is the purpose of God performing miracles? So that they, they might believe. Mm-hmm. Okay, that they might believe. What else? Anything else, maybe? Give God the glory. Good, that he would receive glory by them believing, by him, you know, giving grace and repentance and faith. Uh, yeah, so even thinking about to Moses, you know, performing miracles, as we're going to see some of these other disciples have done. and uh, We're going to see even in the next chapter, uh, we're going to see Peter and John perform one at the temple. And, you know, they're going to immediately deflect to say, this wasn't me who did this, this is God who does this. Uh, it's not us who is able to speak in your languages. You know, we'll see that in the end of this chapter as well. So uh, this was an amazing feat and work of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of where I want to uh, park a little bit today and unpack, because as I was going through this, uh, and really from my last study of, of Acts that, uh, that I was looking at some notes too. I've got some things, uh, if you're note takers, uh, write these down. I think uh, you may be able to add more to them. I have nine. Sorry, Craig, it wasn't ten. Maybe somebody can think ten is Craig's favorite number. Uh, if somebody can think of one more, maybe we could have a round number of having ten points. Uh, but I've got uh, just to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit because we see the Spirit do you know, great miraculous works here. We know uh, many of the things that the scriptures say, and so let's look at these things, and we're not going to have to dive into each uh, of the scriptures, but maybe you can write those down and, uh, and look at them in your own study time later. But uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, number one, uh, the Spirit marks those who are in Christ. When we came through the book of Ephesians, we saw that, how the Holy Spirit uh, is, is the stamp, if you will, or, or the branding that would be upon us. Uh, the thought that I have there is earnest deposit, right, that you put a deposit down to purchase something. And the Holy Spirit is the deposit that you have been purchased. Uh, uh, Ephesians 4.30 says that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That day of redemption is no longer is it going to be by faith, it's by sight. You're with Christ in his presence to be like him because you'll see him for who he is. And so no longer are you sealed, you are with him. You know what I mean? It's, it's, and so that's the difference. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit and no man can pluck you out of God's hand. No one can remove this seal of, of redemption from you. Okay. Um, and if you've got questions or comments, input, certainly uh, raise your hand. We can get through those. I'm just Yes, sir? Meaning like stamped. Yeah. Yeah, good. Kind of like a sealed scroll. You know, that remember whoever whoever sealed that scroll is the one whose un, whose authority is to open the scroll. And we see that in Jesus with the scrolls in, in Revelation. <clears throat> but even throughout deeds and things, uh, that's how that would have gone. And so this deed, you know, is to the owner, and the owner is God, and you are sealed with his seal. Does that make sense? And so he is the one who has purchased you and you are his, is, is the thought there. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the seal uh, that marks those who are in Christ. Uh, number two, 
Holy Spirit, John 16, 8, says that the Spirit came into the world to convict the world of sin. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no conviction of sin, right? I, I think there is some type of moral compass, if you will, that, some, that people have, and we know that, that that's built in you, that God has given every single person a conscience. Uh, but without God, that conscience just continues to get seared and seared and seared as you run through more and more stop signs uh, that God puts up in your path. And so without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be convicted of sin. An unregenerate man doesn't repent of their sin. Does it make sense? An unbeliever doesn't repent of their ways because they are his ways, and, and that's the ways they live by. And they say, hey, don't judge me for what I do. You do what makes you happy. I do what makes me happy. I make the rules. I'm the boss of me, right? And that's who we all were outside of Christ, and that's who all are outside of Christ. So uh, the Holy Spirit, we know that's why he must give us a new heart and cause us to be regenerate or born again because then he gives us the ability to repent of our sins because we recognize they are sin against God. Okay, so the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. Number three, uh, the Holy Spirit spiritually awakens the elect. So, uh, and that was intentionally, uh, you know, that I selected those words, and yes, the elect, not to get into a debate with anyone or to a bigger discussion of predestination and, you know, and all those things, but what does it mean? What does the word election mean? Who is it we're speaking about when we say the elect? Picked. Okay, picked. Yep, it means to be chosen. The spirit, the spirit of God does not spiritually awaken everyone. Is the point right? We understand that the spirit of God only spiritually awakens those whom God has chosen to awaken. Okay, and so regeneration, uh, this this spiritual birth or this this spiritual resurrection. Think of Ephesians two one. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay. Uh, a dead man doesn't bring himself back to life. God is the one who brought us to life. Remember, spiritually speaking, everyone is born dead. It's, it's the Spirit of God that, that causes us to be born again, as Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Okay, so uh, Spirit of God spiritually awakens uh, those who are in Christ. Uh, number four. Um, one that we should pray for continually, you know, as we study the Bible and as we read the Bible, uh, the Holy Spirit teaches believers. The ladies I know just came through one, and, and the guys we just recently are coming through this section of 1 John that, uh, you know, he's talking about antichrist and false teachers and says uh, to be on guard against them and, and that you have no need that any man teach you. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit of God who is your teacher. And so, you know, just to clarify, that doesn't mean he's saying you don't need any human being to help teach you. He's talking in context about false teachers. Uh, and we know that in Ephesians, um, you know, and in, in Corinthians and other places, God tells us that teachers and pastors are a gift to the church uh, to help equip and edify the church and prepare them for the work. So teachers and good teachers and good pastors are a gift from God to us. Uh, so that's not what it means. He's just saying, who is your true teacher? It's the Holy Spirit that teaches you the Word of God. Could you, could you take a Bible and, and live on a you know, deserted island for 20 years, with, if you're saved, and just you and the Bible, and learn and grow in God's ways? Certainly you will, and certainly you can. Uh, so, you know, even without a teacher or, an, a, a, you know, a podcast or YouTube, uh, that will happen because the Holy Spirit is your guide in the Scriptures and your teacher of it. Thoughts or, um, you know, comments on, on any of those so far? As I just catch a, a quick breath. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Uh, number five. Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs believers. Um, Romans 8 says, um, says this, you know, that the Holy Spirit is, is uh, leading us and guiding us. I have Matthew 4 in there because in verse 1 it tells us that Jesus, and so Matthew 4 uh, comes right after Matthew 3, right? Usually 4 comes after 3. And in chapter 3, Jesus had just gotten baptized uh, by John the Baptist. And then that begins his public ministry. And immediately verse 1 of chapter 4 says that the Spirit of God led him, Jesus, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. So a couple interesting things there. Uh, one would be that it's the Spirit that led him into this 
temptation that came. Uh, and so that's significant, uh, but we won't talk about that right now. But the point is that I'm trying to get to is that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Uh, and so we too are prompted and, and led by the Spirit, and not in a way that, you know, we see a neon sign pointing us and telling us to go this way, but, uh, you know, through God's Word, through other believers possibly around us, uh, just prodding and prompting that the Spirit does within us and within our conscience and, and guiding us, you know, in uh, decision-making processes or, or just all kinds of things that, that we're seeking, you know, His counsel in. And so uh, as believers, you know, just thinking of some application in, in some of these last couple things, certainly when we uh, come to the Bible and the Scriptures, we want to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us, to, uh, to give us wisdom and understanding. Uh, we want to pray, uh, we should desire to pray continually that the Holy Spirit would be leading us and, and guiding us in, in paths of righteousness for his namesake, that, uh, you know, that the Spirit will be our guide through all of life today. Uh, and if we get tomorrow, same prayer tomorrow, right? That these are, these are to be things that, that believers should be uh, asking for and desiring. And number six, the Holy Spirit places believers in the family of God. This speaks to the doctrine of adoption. Uh, to which Romans 8, 15 speaks of, uh, you know, that we um, have the spirit of adoption, it says. Uh, and so the spirit of adoption, meaning that the spirit has caused us to be born again. And in our being born again, we are born of God and we're born into his family. Uh, that's the idea that uh, we have been adopted uh, by God, that we were once children of wrath and children of the evil one. And now He's taking us out of that family and put us into a new family, amen? That we are now his child and now brothers and sisters with one another and brothers and sisters with Christ and co-heirs with Christ, inheriting, uh, you know, as Paul says in Ephesians, uh, every spiritual, you know, blessing in the heavenly places. That's a pretty awesome thing when you think about that, right? I know we unpack that a lot in, in Ephesians, uh, but uh, what, what a great you know, what a great doctrine the, the doctrine of adoption is. Okay, number next, uh, seven. The Holy Spirit actively, sorry, I saw some writers. Do we need to go back a page? Did you get that one? Good. The Holy Spirit uh, actively works to make believers holy. And what do we call that process? Sanctification. Sanctification, yeah, so... Uh, there's the ongoing, that's the ongoing process, you know, that the Holy Spirit has in us. Um, I've got Ezekiel 36, 26 up there. That could have probably been under the first heading. Um, you know, that's speaking of the heart transplant, that he must remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. But Philippians 1, 6 says that, uh, Paul says, I know that he who begun a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ. So he, you know, Jesus and, and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, has begun this good work in you. So it's him who started it and begun it. And he says he will uh, continue it and he will one day complete it. So remember, one day we'll have that um, perfected sanctification in glory with, with Jesus forever. Uh, and that's certainly a day we look forward to. But in these days that we're granted on this earth, uh, from the time we've been saved, we are to continue to grow to be more holy right, to be more sanctified, meaning to be, that means to be set apart, uh, to be made holy. And so, yes, there's human responsibility in that. Yes, we've got to go to the gym. We've got to pick up the weights. Uh, but it's, it's God who has given us the desire to do that. And it's him who gives the increase when we lift the weights and when we work out. He's the one that causes the muscles and the fibers to break and to rip and to heal back so that they will be bigger and stronger, right? That's the work he does. Thoughts, questions, comments? That's good. These are pretty, that's good. We should, uh, we should understand these things, you know, as, as believers. So it's good. Question. Yeah, it's so good. you're talking about sanctification and how that's an ongoing process and that that will arrive, I don't know, whatever the ending, that completion is. Um, we always talk about how you'll never arrive. You know, you'll never mm. get there. You'll always have more to learn. But then as you say that, yeah, there should be growth. You should be growing and learning more but what about those like I, we were just talking about the thief on the cross on wednesday night so he didn't have time yeah so do you feel like that something happens in our glorified bodies that we get understanding like is there some kind of good 
Yeah, good question. Yeah, so certainly when Paul says, or we say we haven't arrived, meaning in this flesh, Mm -hmm. you know, that we won't ever achieve that this side of heaven. Um, But yeah, it's important to note that, you know, I think as, as Brian talked about with just people misusing the word miracles, there's so many words and so many thoughts and so many doctrines even that we have confused, you know, for a while that need some help maybe unpacking. And I think one of those is, I think many of us, think that when we die and we go to heaven, like, we're going to know everything. And, and we're going to, you know, be just totally, oh, we've arrived, we're 100%, we, like, like almost we're gods or something, that we know everything that's ever happened or will happen. Uh, and so I think that's a great um, question to, to help us understand that, you know, that's not going to be the case. Think about who it is that we're learning and, and understanding more. It's an infinite God. To, to whom, you know, to whose love and grace and mercy knows no end and has no bottom. That's what this idea of lavished upon means. Like he, draw, he, he draws from a well that is, never reaches the bottom. So I think it's misunderstanding to think that we're not going to continue for all of eternity to grow in understanding more the depths of God and of Christ and of his love and of his grace and of his mercy of his glory uh, because it says you know that when we see him we will see him as he is and we'll be like him because we see him like he is in his glorified state like you're talking about we will receive glorified status there's just going to be so much more that I think the scriptures tell us that there's much much more that's going to be happening up there Uh, so no it's not like you're going to wherever you die right now so the thief on the cross isn't in heaven right where he was like in that day does it, if that makes sense, if I'm trying to answer your question He's growing, directly. but the guy that was there from 500 years ago is more sanctified than him probably still. Like, they're continuing to grow, you feel like. I don't know. Yeah, like I don't It was th- just funny when you were saying that. It made me think, like, yeah. what exactly does that look like? After, I don't after think we can. Like, I, we yeah. can't answer dogmatically, yeah. you know, about about that. But I just, I just believe the scriptures lead to say, when you die here, that's not the end of, <laughs> that's not the end of God revealing Party. himself to you. Uh, if that makes sense. Do you have anything to add to that? Sure. So on this side of heaven, now believers all have a saving faith, which gets them to heaven. Uh, but then different measures of faith and giftedness as we work out our salvation, fear and trembling until we die. And so you see uh, different Christians sanctifying at a different pace to a different level and some for an hour before they die, and some for 100 years before they die. And so the thief on the cross you know, didn't have much of a sanctification journey. Um, and sanctification is shorthand for becoming more like Christ. And then when we die, we're glorified. And so we swap this body out for glorified ones. And so I would think in those glorified bodies, there's no more calcium deficiencies with people having weak bones and there's no brains that suffer from the noetic effects of the fall where their logic train is unable to follow the right path and so now you have a mind that can retain understand whatever god chooses to reveal right. over the course of eternity and to his point the fact that he's infinite means that it would take an infinite amount of time for yeah. us to comprehend all that there is to comprehend about who this great God of ours is. And so it's going to be a wonderful existence. We're never going to get bored right. or tired. Uh, it's just going to be this graph that's on a continual rise in our understanding and enjoyment of who he is in our glorified state for eternity. And then try to try to wrap our mind around that. Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's pretty amazing. Well said. Okay, uh, good. Next, number eight. Holy Spirit uh, gives gifts to believers. We also saw this in our study of Ephesians chapter 4, where it says that when he ascended, uh, he sent the Spirit, uh, which we're seeing that here, right? And that, uh, that he gifted men at that time with spiritual gifts. And so we see that firsthand in the account that we're looking at in, in Acts chapter 2. Yeah, Elaine, did you have something? Oh, sorry. Yep. Sorry. I, I was looking down. You were looking up. Yep. Uh, just a, the basis of the last uh-huh. thing that we were talking about is that now that we, we 
only see by faith, but it has all these dimming aspects to it right now. The flesh is part of it. Yeah. And uh, that's what gets removed when we are actually in his presence actually seeing it. Good. And then, then there's the sanctification process that has to do with us having all these dimming things happening to us because we're in the flesh. Good. But he, he filled that out. Yeah, but I like the dim and the, and the removed, as you said that. I like that, too, because I think later on in chapter 9 of, of Saul and the scales being removed from his eyes, as they have been for us to, to receive salvation. But to Elaine's point, you know, to, to piggyback on Brian's point, is that there's more of those things that will be removed in the future that will open up the pathways to what Brian was talking about. The flesh, it. you know, all when those things will it, be stripped away. When we're in glory, the, the enemy's not there. Right. All that's gone. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, great point. That seems like it would be a huge blocker. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of blockers. Take it out of your way to see right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I was just looking over at Nancy, and she put her, you put your glasses on, and it just made me think, like, glad, like, it'd be like how I can't see without my glasses, and now all that just coming to focus so much better. You know. The ultimate LASIK surgery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is what we're talking about. That's great. Like a whole new beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yeah. There. In fact, just giving you brand new eyes. Just glorified, perfect eyes. Yeah, even better. So we've got the heart transplant. We've got the LASIK eye surgery. Uh, we're just going to keep adding procedures to this thing. I'm going to need a few more. I'm sure there's lots of analogies we can go with. Yeah. Uh, number eight, uh, the Spirit gives gifts to believers. We were just talking about that. Uh, number nine. Last one, spirit prays with and for believers. Uh, we find that out in Romans 8 also, you know, that, uh, that even when we are unable to say and speak the words that we should say in prayer, uh, that the spirit is praying for us on behalf of us. And, uh, you know, think of intercession and, uh, you know, Jesus and his intercessory prayers and, you know, that we can pray for one another and just that the spirit, uh, you know, assists us in our prayer life as well. Excuse me. I'm looking at my time. I think we're good. We got 15 minutes. Um, so, any any more comments or questions? Yeah, on those. Sometimes I'm distracted with cross references. But, yep. But maybe I have a tenth for you. Did you good. say that the Holy Spirit restrains the evil? No, I said convicts the world of sin. So that's a good one. Yeah. So I think it's slightly different. Second. Yeah. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two, verses uh, six and seven. And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in this time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Right. So, so even though Satan is prince of the power of the air, there is this restraining uh, that the Holy Spirit does to prevent him from going full scale. Right. Uh, no, that's evil. a great point. I think there's some interpretive differences in that verse too. Is that referring to the Holy Spirit, or is it referring mm-hmm. to? Uh, Michael the Archangel, and so, but to your point, I think it's, I think it's valid and true. Yep. Uh, whether it's from that verse or not. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There there's number 10, Craig. Put that down. I like it. Thank you. Uh, um, could yep. that kind of thing be like, you know, what prevents, prevents the devil from snatching them from Jesus' hands? Like, you know, I mean, he's a protector. That's the protector Amen. that we get. Certainly, which would fall under the the seal and the protection. Yeah, all those things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What you can't do for yourself, whatever you know, you try to resist sin, you try to resist evil, but knowing that you've got the Holy Spirit on your side doing the same thing with you. Yeah, and but I was saying restraining evil in a more general sense for the the world, yeah, population, not just specifically Christians. Right. Just in general, that without if the Holy Spirit were removed. As if he could be, right, as if he could be, but if the Holy Spirit were removed from this world, it'd be tenfold worse than it is, is what Brian's point is, which is valid. Because it would be overrun just by the God of this world and no interference by God himself. What about the Old Testament? Same thing. I think same thing. I mean, it wasn't that easy to get the Holy Spirit back then, no. Sure, but the Holy Spirit was always still there, though, right? Right. Right, so he was still working, right? wasn't as abundant as it is now. Yeah, just right, a little different maybe that he indwells, like you said, permanently, yeah, in each of us. 
which goes to Sky's point too. Yeah, I don't know. I would just say that it's a different covenant. It's a different thing. Remember that the, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He was always there. He was always in the world. He was always saving the people that he was saving. It's always been the same. It just looks different. The old was pointing to the new. But people were always saved the same way. The Holy Spirit of God has always existed and always been there. So the Holy Spirit just didn't arrive on Pentecost and was a new thing. You know, does that make sense? The Holy Spirit of God, just so we're all kind of on the same page, has always been there. He just didn't indwell in us? Mm-hmm. Permanently, right. Good. I know, so good, I thing, a, good things to tackle and work through. <laughs> I have another random question. So I feel like often you're prompted by the Holy Spirit, or we say that, um, but God also uses people to do things that aren't believers, so is that not not prompting by the Holy Spirit though because they don't have the Holy Spirit so yeah this would go back to the whole Judas thing and the thing that we've been circling around for the last couple of weeks I think I think in John I think in, in y'all's study of the Sermon on the Mount and this preaching of the Sermon on the Mount God, the Spirit of God uses whoever he wants to it doesn't matter if they're saved or not Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Pharaoh you know what I mean is Judas that that Holy Spirit that's not convicting them, but using them to do what he wants to. Yeah, God, remember, God is the chess player moving every single piece however he wants to. It doesn't matter if it's a saved or unsaved piece. He, he's orchestrating all of it. I guess I'm just it. saying, like, the title. Is it God doing that or the Holy Spirit doing that? I don't yes. know. I'm just getting caught up in that. Yeah, I God, guess yes. Right. I would say yes is the <laughs> yes. answer. Yes. So whether or not it's, it's God Holy or you Spirit. want to say, oh, it's Satan or it's the work of Satan, it's God, it's God. doing it all. So God utilized Hitler for the curse of the Jews, something like that? To accomplish what he accomplished through it, yes. Killing of James in Acts later, chapter 12, I think, that we'll see. I mean, you can pick, it doesn't have to be Hitler, you can pick anything or anyone. Judas is perfect. Yes, it is God who moved and and did all this. To betray him, that was the Holy Spirit that prompted So think about it, theologically speaking, if it wasn't him, and it was Satan or somebody that enticed uh, Hitler to do what he did, then God surprised and he didn't know what was going to happen. Is, I mean, is that a... That's oh, not he a... He allowed it. That's how I would look at it. Okay, so... It was, I, that's a good... The, it. Yeah, that's a good theological point of what, what then does God allow? Right. He allows what he wills to happen. <clears throat> people... <clears throat> there is a thought in the church and, and teachings that people say, well... There's his sovereign will and these other types of wills that they want to name. And then there's one called his permissible will, which means his allowable will. But if you're talking about sovereign God and sovereign will, you don't need to think about any of those other wills. Everything that happens, happens according to God's plan. If it doesn't, then he's not sovereign. If anything can happen that he didn't orchestrate and make happen, he's not sovereign. And it happened outside of him. Does that make sense? So, okay, I just allowed that to happen. No, he only allows to happen what he has happened. Yeah, it makes and, and so, because otherwise he's I'll give you an example, actually. Uh, somebody from church was asking me about this this week, and I don't remember now. Um, yes, I do. Okay, so he was asking me about a text, and I think it's in Chronicles, but it's also in Samuel. Uh, and it says, it's about David, and it says... Uh, in Samuel, I believe it says that Satan incited uh, uh, David, excuse me, Satan incited David to count the people of Israel. That's what the verse says. Satan incited David and he sinned against God by counting the people and doing something he shouldn't have done. When you look at the account of Chronicles, it says the Lord incited David. The same exact account. <coughs> And the only words that change is Satan incited him, and then later on it says the Lord incited David to sin against him and count the people. And it's the same account. It's when uh, God's going to punish and lots of people die because of what David did. Uh, And it says that God is the one who used Satan to incite and entice David to accomplish judgment that God was going to do on these people. That's kind of a picture that I can think of right now. 
that would say to you, you know, that says to me, God is sovereign over all things, and he's the one working in through every single thing that happens. The, par- the accident happens, boom, right now in the parking lot. There's no accidents, right, to God. Um, so th- these are good questions, the good things to, to continue to work out, you know, in, in our um, theology to understand if, it's, if it happens and it's allowable or permissible by God, it can't be that it happened outside of his will and he's just allowing it. That, that takes away and negates sovereignty. Sovereignty means you control everything. And you're God over all things. Well, I think that's where the gray area for people comes because you could make your brain explode thinking these things out. Yeah. Um, but I think it's good for you to do, though. It is good, but it hurts your head. <laughs> it is very good for you to do because you want to understand what is the true. We want to know theology. Doctrine and theology are important. What What is it that we believe about God? Do we believe that things happen outside of his plan and design and that he just allows that and then he guides it back into the path? Or do we believe that, that the Bible teaches God is the designer of the plan and makes everything happen to make that plan happen? See what I mean? There's two different theological roads there. And so it's good to work through that as individuals, even on your own time, as you know, some of you are thinking through this now even for the first time. Uh, it's very good to work through those things and go study it and look at scriptures and texts and commentaries that, that can assist you in, in understanding, you know, what what does that mean uh, well, that's to, to be sovereign? About free will. Well, we're not going to get into that now just because we have four minutes. Uh, I, and I mean that whole, you know, the whole side of that track, I guess, uh, Brooke, because you're, you bring in a great point, which is free will. And uh, again, free will <laughs> who, God bless you, who has given you the free will that you God. experience? God. And you only have the free will to whatever degree God chooses to give it to you. Does that make sense? That's because he's sovereign. So did God did God step over boundaries and affect the free will of Pharaoh? He did. Did he do it to David in the, in the account that I'm talking about? He did. God intervened and stepped on your free will in order to save you. There's the big theological, you know, nugget. That it's in spite of you and your sin and who you were, you were never going to choose God. You never sought God and you never would have loved God. You never would have been saved by him in your free will. Because your will can only act upon what your nature is and your nature is dead in your trespasses and sins outside of Christ. That's why no one can be born of God or born again on their own without God doing it. God must change your heart and change your will in order for you now to repent and believe in him. And so when you talk about free will, let me just put it easily. The sovereign will of God trumps any free will that we think we have every single time. Cyrus, it was not his choice to tell the people to go back after captivity and rebuild the temple in the city. He was a pagan king. Darius, same thing. Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh. Again, we could go on and on and on the list of unbelievers who God chose to use. And he calls, he calls uh, Cyrus in the Old Testament. He says, Cyrus is my anointed one. Cyrus wasn't a believer and wasn't saved. By all accounts, we see in the scriptures. But he says, he is the one I chose, is what he's saying, to accomplish my will. And I do that with every single person and every single thing that happens is what I think the Bible says God says to us. Just like with Judas. Well, I'm thinking of Jacob and Esau in Malachi and Romans. It both talks about how God chose to love Jacob and hate Esau before the foundation of the world. It says before they were born, I've already chosen this. So that you would know that that I did it. Yep. Before they were even born. <laughs> exactly. Crazy. I'm going to close with this because I'm not going to be here next week. Pastor Brian's going to be teaching uh, next week. So I just want to show you this map because um, we were supposed to get through 13 and he's picking up on 14, which we didn't, but he'll cover some of those. But I just do want to show you this map in closing. This has been all uh, just great stuff. And again, keep working this out for yourself. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Bible. Listen to the Spirit of God that teaches uh, and here's just a map to show who are these people 
these Galileans are speaking to that are in such awe and amazement, right, that it says, verse 7, they were amazed and astonished. Verse 12 says, they continued in amazement and great perplexity. I would say so. These Judeans, these Galileans, just came out and spoke to all these different people groups in these languages, and we have them listed in verses 9 through 11, okay? And so here's, here's the map of, like, this area, and, I mean, it's, it's huge. So right down here, you can see if you can see this. That's, there's Jerusalem, and here's Judea and the surrounding area. That's, you know, where they're gathering. This is the area and the land from where they're coming. I mean, it's, uh, it talks about Egypt. It talks about uh, Libya. It talks about Cyrenians coming. So they're all coming from this direction. Um, this is actually Syria over here. And as we get into later uh, parts of our study, there will be some maps that I'll show you for Paul's mission trips and stuff. Uh, so this would be Syria, and Antioch is up here somewhere where they will be leaving for the journeys. Up here is Tarsus, where Paul is from. This Cappadocia Pontus area um, is the area of, and this Phrygia and Pamphylia, that's all Galatia. So that's Galatians, uh, we'll come to see. Then you have Asia over there, which is going to have uh, Ephesus, uh, the book of Ephesians, right? It has these seven churches that are listed in the book of Revelation are in the area of Asia there. As you go up in the top left there, that's actually Macedonia, which is um, Thessalonica and Philippi and Berea. And then it comes down in that little section there. That's Greece where you have Corinth and Athens. Like all these things, all these places we're going to see Paul visit and others later. Then off to the left over there, you have the big foot, you know, the big footprint, the boot of Rome. Uh, which there's people coming from Rome uh, here. So this is just to show you, this is what a big deal these feasts are, that all the people are coming from all these areas that are very long and significant journeys to get here for this feast. That Remember, they were here 50 days prior. Now they're here again. And all those people groups speak all these different languages. And so this is the amazing work uh, that the Holy Spirit has, has done in this. And so as we close, um, we've been focused today, you know, around uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and in that, you know, our discussion and our questions and commentary about uh, the sovereignty of God. And I think, you know, that all comes from the Spirit of God who reveals the truth of the gospel to us, but then continues the work like you guys talked about uh, in sanctification, continues that work in us. And so... You know, we got to continue to, to pray and ask that he will continue to work, that he will enlighten us, teach us, give us understanding of what these things mean, yes, in this transition time in the church, but also for us today in the church, and that uh, he gifts and equips, and how can we use the giftedness, how can we use the things that he's given us to help others uh, greater worship him. And so I think that's you know, what we see here in the, in the text here today is the Holy Spirit does amazing, incredible work, in, in, and he's done it in the life of all of us who are believers here, and he continues to do that in, you know, the hearts of, of people today. But how does he do that? By them hearing the gospel. These men and women went out and proclaimed the gospel to the people around them. Don't we have the same call upon us? We do. We may not have the same giftedness that they, that God might not teach Nancy how to speak Spanish. So when she's here on Tuesday, she can communicate with those people. But he's called her to talk to other people. And he's called me and he's called you to witness to the different spheres of influence that we all have. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he, he is the one doing the work, but we are the ones he's chosen to do it through. So we've got to be obedient like these disciples were and be praying together like these disciples were that he would use us to do a great work just like he did then. Look, God still continues to do great work. Yes, it looks different, and yes, we're in a different time and a different age, but this age is not over, which I know biblically speaking means he has not stopped working in the hearts and lives of people. Because when he has chosen, that time is over. This age will end, and he will come again in glory. And every eye will see him. And that will be the time that, you know, the separation of the two will happen. Until that time, he's still saving people. And we've got to be uh, obedient, as these were. Father, help us to do that. Uh, Lord, help us to 
uh, be obedient, and we know that we can better do that if your spirit continues to abide in us and we abide in your word. We know that your spirit abides in us, causes us to be born again, and never leaves us nor forsake us. God is, is us who walks away. It is us who, through our sin, uh, pushes you away and causes strain and distance in our relationship. So, God, uh, we confess and repent of our sin that you would forgive us because we know you were, you forgive us when we confess to you because you are faithful and just. Uh, Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Draw us near to you as we try to draw near to you. Equip us, enable us, empower us to do great things for your namesake. We pray in Jesus' name.